So welcome and thank you very much for joining us today for the second session of this training. And um, me and uh, Francesca Frattini and Mia are really happy to have you. And uh, so today we'll dive deeper into the FAIR by design methodology. Thank you for the uh, first part, which was a success. And now we will see uh, even more uh, details on the process. So um, I uh, give the floor to the uh, skills for um team. Uh, thank you very much for being here, for your time. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the second session of the training today. Uh, we'll start with the first, a very brief recap of the Fear by Design methodology and introduce the interactive tool that we're going to use uh, today. But first of all, I want to give you a small disclaimer from my side. Today, I'm sharing the space with my two emotional support animals. I have two cats. So if you hear some sounds in the background, I'm, I'm very sorry. Sometimes they get excited because they're not in the center of attention, but they are currently sleeping. So I hope it will be fine as Anastasia is doing most of the talking today. So let's start with just a short recap of uh, what we were discussing uh, in more details in the first session. This was the introduction to the fair by design methodology. Just in case we have someone who hasn't uh, been in the first session or you just need to, to remind yourself on the, let's say, big story. The idea of the fair by design methodology was that uh, we introduced some changes into the backward instructional design process in order to empower it with their principles. And in the end, after you follow the methodology, the result should be fair learning materials uh, from the point of view of learners and instructors and other trainers. So they should be very easy to be reused and uh, adapted to other, other purposes. The way the methodology is uh, designed, there are six stages through which you need to go through before you deliver the actual learning material. But then the story is not complete. You go back and do another cycle and another cycle of continuous improvement. In the different stages, we focused on different things uh, regarding the fear principles. For an example, in the prepare stage, the main focus is on getting to know the RDA, minimum metadata schema, which we recommend for the description of the learning materials. This is the first, um, let's say, global metadata schema that showed up, focusing explicitly on learning materials. Of course, if you want, you can take this schema, extend it, and adapt it to your own uh, specific domain. What you need to do is basically take all of the defined fields in the schema, because this is the minimum set, and then you add your own to make it more clear and descriptive for your domain purposes. After you get acquainted with the minimal metadata schema, then in the first stage, you start the backward instructional design process and you need to define the initial things about your learning materials. These include the purpose, the target audience, the prerequisites, if there are any, what is the scope of the learning material, and then formulating the learning objectives. For the learning objectives, just make sure that you define them in a smart way. That means that they are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Our recommendation is to use the Bloom's taxonomy for these purposes, but of course you can do it in a different way. Once you know the skeleton of your learning material, you defined your learning objectives. The second thing that you can do is go inside the discover stage and get inspired by looking, searching for already existing learning materials that you can reuse. Just be careful that you can reuse only stuff that are available under a permissible license. If the license is not permissible, then you can use these things only as inspiration and nothing more. If there is no license attached, then the best thing is to directly contact the author of the learning material and try to get permission for reuse. If you don't receive any permission, you are kind of allowed to reuse the content, but if at any point in time the author contacts you to tell you to remove the content, you have to oblige um, by his wishes. There are different places where you can search for materials. First, you need to try to search in the repositories in your domain. If you don't find it, then there are open educational resources, EOSC resources, general resources. 
is a node of an example is a repository that belongs to to this last uh, group also don't forget to search for multimedia because it's important to add uh, multimedia content to your learning learning materials once you got inspired you know what you want to reuse uh, now you need to fill up the gaps and create the whole concept the whole structure of your learning materials you are practically in the design stage the first task to do is to prepare and develop the syllabus. The syllabus is this high level blueprint of the learning materials that you are going to develop. Once you have the bird's view, then you dive deep into the granular structure. And then you say, okay, I will have this many modules, this many units organized in this way. These parts will be covered in this section. These parts are going to be covered in that section and so on. These parts I will reuse. These other parts I need to develop by myself. When you need to develop stuff in the design stage, you make a list of all of the things that are missing. Just be careful that when we say all of the things you need to develop, we also include here the instructor's kit. What is inside the instructor kit? Everything that is not learning content. This includes learning unit plot, assessment, description of activities, if there are any interactive activities, um, strategies on how to do the assessment, a facilitation guide for someone who wants to redo the training and needs to know what to do during, before, after the training, and of course, a way to gather feedback about the developed learning materials. All of this um, is also developed together with the actual learning content of the, of the learning materials. At the end of the design stage, you have a clear view of the structure of your learning materials, all of the stuff that uh, you're going to reuse, what you need to develop, and you're ready to move to the next stage, which was produce. Inside produce, you're choosing the tools and the file formats that you're going to use for your learning materials. You can do whatever you want here, as long as the fi file formats are open, that means they can be opened according to a provided specification of the file format. They're not close to a specific tool or solution. Be careful, we are talking about two different sets of files here. The first set is the editable set, which is very important for instructional designers and trainers. The second set is the final format. This is the stuff that you actually share with your learners this is the final product that you give to others to learn based on your learning materials uh, while you're producing the learning material one of the main things in the fair by design methodology is that we augment the accessibility part with accessibility of the learning material in the sense that they should cover the widest range of learners that means that be careful to think about learners that might need assistive technology in order to consume your learning materials and consider making your materials um, compliant with uh, different accessibility standards, such as the one developed by the W3 consortium, or if it's a PDF document, the final version, for an example, there is a universal access standard for that as well. This process of producing the learning materials is never straightforward, right? You go forward, backward, change something here, change something there, maybe change the structure as you go on and so on. It's quite normal, right, to make changes as you are developing. Just don't forget, you also need to produce the facilitation guide, the whole instructor kit. And when you are developing the metadata for description of your learning materials, you need to develop it both for human readability and for machine readability. Once you think you're done, you do a quick internal quality assessment where you check if you have everything that you need to have, are all of the requirement elements there, and then you also do a qualitative check. You go through the learning units and you see if the content is okay, if you're covering all the, the learning modalities and so on. If the self-check is fine, you pass it, then you go to the next stage, which, which is publish. In this stage, the first thing you do is make the final preparations. That means you develop accompanying files that help make the materials easy to reuse. 
uh, and collaborate on so files such as VD, such as how to cite these materials, such as code of conduct when you're working together in a team or you want external parties to join you for the next uh, version and so on. When you do the final preparations, you're ready to publish your materials into a repository of your choice. It can be domain specific, it can be general. You need to develop a standardized workflow to do this, just to make sure that you follow the same rules and principles for all of the learning materials. It can be automated, it can be manual. For an example, we are using GitHub as the collaboration environment, and we have an automated workflow on GitHub that will publish the materials on the Nodo. Anastas will tell you more about it later. The final step is to publish the materials for learners' consumption. This can be different things. It depends on the system and tools that you're using. For an example, if there is a separate learning management system, this means that this is the moment where you place the final formats on the learning management system and you add stuff such as question bank, create quizzes, maybe add a webinar room if it's a online workshop, or if you have some kind of certificate, you need to define the rules, how these are going to be provided. The final stage is the verify stage. In this stage, we provide a number of uh, checklists that you can use in order to check if you have everything so that you can say, yes, my materials are high quality, they are fair by design, everything is okay. There are different levels of fairness that you can achieve here because some of the elements in the checklists are required, some are optional, we will talk about it more later. You also need to do an external quality assessment because sometimes the external eyes see stuff that the development team doesn't. You always check from the perspective of a learner and in the end of Verify, you set up the way to gather feedback from all parties. So from learners, but also from other peer instructors and, and trainers. The input that you get from the verify stage, it can be internal, it can be external. Anastas will talk to you more about this. The idea is that you gather everything, you analyze it. The output of this analysis is a list of potential improvements. Then you you prioritize these items and you start working on the high priority items. Once you complete the high priority items, you actually created a new version of the learning materials that need to be published again. So you keep going through this cycle of the fair by design methodology, improving the materials, creating new versions, keeping them up to date, adding content based on comments, remarks, uh, gathered feedback, and so on. In the first session, we focused on the first four stages. So we talked about prepare, discover, design, and produce. Now we are going to focus more on the last three parts, which is publish, verify, and uh, continuous improvements. Our hands-on for today is actually the implementation of the quality assessment checklist for checking the fairness of already existing learning materials. Uh, with that, we did a very, very short recap. We'll start this uh, second session after the, the recap with a few words about the versioning or the versioning control. Uh, we'll speak about the need for versioning. Uh, how do we implement versioning through versioning management system? Which one we opted within the Fair by Design methodology? Uh, and then some important things related to the to the versioning, especially the one of the specific uh, accompanying files, the file, the so-called release notes file, which is very important to keep track of the versioning. And uh, a few words at the end about the numerical uh, numerical representation of the versioning, the meaning of different elements of the of the versioning, and uh, try to explain when to change a major, minor version. What does a change in a minor or a major version? Uh, means for uh, for the for the materials so it is very important that the training material is con considered to be some kind of a living matter we need to keep constantly upgrading in updating correcting the mistakes etc because that's the only way that the training material will remain relevant to the to the topic or to the subject that it covers but if you 
make those changes, the, there is always the risk of losing yourself within the changes and keeping track of the changes is actually what versioning is, addressing the challenges of constant changes needed to improve this, this material. There are different uh, options and versions to uh, options to to implement the the, um, the the versioning system. Since we already talked about GitHub and already talk, talked about the, the the MD format, etc., it was natural to again turn to Git for as a versioning system because it is, as a matter of fact, an industry standard versioning management system that is used not only by the software developers, but as you can see, and as you already uh, mentioned in the first session that you use and know in many other many other areas like training material development. What is important is to keep the consistency of the numbering of the version and to keep some kind of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, to, to keep some kind of notes that will accompany each version. So, Everyone will be aware. Uh, Git has a quite comprehensive versioning uh, management implemented already. Um, I will just mention only a couple of 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 uh, of words of a couple of 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 um, uh, actions that we use uh, that uh, activities that we do in, uh, uh, in that you can do in Git and how they relate to the versioning of the materials. Um, whenever you want to develop a new training material, for example, based on the template that we offer at the Fair by Design methodology, it's very easy. So all you have to do is go to the GitHub repository and make a fork of the repository, which means make a copy of the repository or the or any other, other training material. This copy is of course related to the original to the original uh, to the original um, material. It's one one to one copy of the of the Git repository, uh, and uh, uh, which can be used for your own purposes to modify to if it's a template then to build up the courses. If it's already made course to make some changes needed um, for for a specific for a specific pur purpose. Then an important. Uh, an important uh, action in Git is in Git is the commit. Uh, each commit to the repository means that you have implemented some changes to the materials, and you are committing them to the to the uh, repository of your own or to the repository from which you have you you have cloned previously to be working on. Um, all these changes are then updated in the associated Git uh, in the associated GitHub repository, but also in the case of the methodology and in many other cases where GitHub is used as a, as a, not as a classical software software um, uh, repository, but as a repository for written materials. Um, associated actions can help you update the web presence of this Git repository, the so-called Gitbook. So each time when you commit something to the repository, some actions are triggered. And after some time, depending on the number of changes and depending on the actions you have, a new, um, uh, your GitHub pages will be updated, will be reflect the changes you have made. And then we come to the, to the last of these three um, actions that we, that we take on GitHub, which is called the GitHub release. The GitHub release, means that you produce a whole new version of the learning material. And each GitHub release has a, uh, has a, 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 a bigger effect on the training materials. GitHub release produces a new version, but GitHub release also does many other things that we will see in a later presentation today. Uh, among others, it will update it the materials on the Zenodo, if you already had a, a release previously, or if you're if it's your first release and you have linked your GitHub repository to Zenodo, it will create the Zenodo um, entry. It will create the Zenodo entry with all the materials from the GitHub repository packed in a nice zip archive. Um, to keep track of what you changed, to make it easier, both for the learners that have used previously maybe this material and want to come back to this material 
or for the teachers, for the fellow teachers or instructors that are using this material to, to deliver courses or webinars or whatever they do, it's important to have um, um, release notes associated with each release, which means with each version of the of the document, of the um, repository, of the, of the material. In the case of the fair by design training, uh, fair by design methodology, we show the content of the release notes. Release notes is just an MD file. It should be in the root folder of your repository. And it contains the changes that you have made to the materials. Uh, in the case of the learning method, the fair by design learning methodology, we display the content of the of the release uh, release notes at the landing page, at the first page of each course. We have shown here the example of um, another um, training material, the original actually training materials used for train of trainers within the skills for years because it already has three minor version. It started with, uh, uh, it's uh, at the version 1.3.0 from 1st of July this year. And the changes below the three bullets reflect the changes with respect to the previous one, two, zero. And then you have changes with respect to the previous version, etc. It's a good practice to have the release notes file um, ordered by, by, by date. So you will you will easy it will be easy, easier to 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 track the changes from each version this helps a lot if you are a student that that uh, took a previous uh, uh, that used this uh, that uh, used this material for some course you can always find the the one that you uh, have you have used at the time or see the changes that happened that happened to the materials in the meantime uh, as you can see here up at the top of your page, there is the latest Dropbox. There is a latest uh, box um, um, that uh, you can uh, click and select any previous version. So Git Pages allows you, by default, it lends you to the latest version of the document. But it also allows you, by selecting a previous version from this um, box Dropbox here at the at the at the, the uh, top of the page to select a show any previous version. For example, if you take the go and see the learning materials for the train of trainers, you can select here 1.2 and it will get you to the previous version. And then once you are ready, once you have everything for for publishing, then you need to go to the to the final step to make a new iteration. New iteration means that you will have a new version for this for this um, for this uh, new release or new version of the training document. Usually, we use this three part um, uh, three part dot decimal uh, representation of the versions of the of the documents or software or whatever it is. Uh, the left one being called the major version, the middle one being called the minor version, and the last one being called the patch. Uh, each of these numbers has a specific, um, it's, uh, 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 each of these numbers is associated, uh, each of these positions is associated with specific changes in the, in the document. If you only made some technical fixes, some bugs, some uh, hot fixes, some uh, typos that you have found in the document, some wrong information that was shown previously, then you do not produce a new version. You actually increment the patch number. If you change something that includes, uh, uh, so if you change something that includes, um, that may that represent an incremental improvement, but does not change the overall structure of the learning material, then you usually change the minor version, as you can see. As you saw in the previous slide, we have released uh, three new minor versions of the document. None of them meant that we have changed the structure. We have added some new features. We have added some new elements. Uh, we have added maybe some new activities into the existing structure of the training materials. If you change the structure, then you have made a major change, which means that you need to change the major the major number or the major the major version. Thank you, Anastas. Yes. So up to now, we were talking about the collaboration system and how we organize the uh, 
uh, work and the different versions of the training materials. Remember, if you want to reuse a training material as a basis for something, but then you plan to, I don't know, change uh, the structure, add stuff, remove stuff, uh, because it's, it's a similar, but not the same training. According to the methodology, we recommend that you fork from the original repository and then uh, start uh, new versioning and implement your, your changes. In this way, if you want, you can keep up to date with the changes to the original material that you're reusing, but uh, you'll get the freedom to change the structure and remove stuff that you, you don't need. We are moving on now to a different topic also related to the publishing stage, which is the recognition framework. So uh, together with the fair by design methodology, there is a special task inside the skills for your project that is focusing on recognition and developing a recognition framework. The idea is to define more formally the use of digital credentials so on how they can be used to provide professionals, experts, students of open science with proof of their skills. And when we say proof of the skills, we mean for both learners, so people that are attending uh, courses, trainings, uh, whatever it is, and instructors, people that are giving the, the trainings and the, and the courses. Why do we need the digital trick credentials? Well, of course, for other uh, organizations, for employers, future employers, to be able to recognize the skills that have been obtained with the trainings, pro professional, unprofessional, formal, informal, whatever they are um in in whatever way they are provided how it works inside skills for us well if you remember from session one nana already spoke about uh, this a little bit this is just a reminder um first of all uh for the open science skills there is a separate task which is called minimum viable skills it defines the so-called open science profiles so it says if you want to be a data steward you need to have this and this and these skills right then we use the fair by design methodology to develop learning materials. These learning materials are actually provided in order for people to obtain the skills that are defined in the, in the profiles. Before we release the learning material, we go through quality assurance framework that is developed inside the project and we will talk about it later. And then we provide the learning to the learners. The idea with the recognition framework is that once the learners have gone through the learning material, if you remember, according to the Fairby design methodology, there should also be assessment attached to all of the learning units. So the learners are going to go through the assessment. If they have been successful, depending on the rule, what is successful, and then let's say above 80% of uh, the quizzes or the homeworks that were assigned or whatever, then they received the digital credentials. Uh, they are issued, so inside skills for us, we issue the digital credentials after completing the learning content and doing the assessment. However, in different situations, right, someone might decide that they don't want to do assessment in that case, you can provide digital credentials for attendance only. So for people that have attended the training, they will receive some kind of a digital certificate that they attended this and this type of training that was focusing on this learning objectives, was lasting this duration, was providing this and this information. There is, a, of course, a set of pros and cons if you should provide digital credentials for attendance only or not. It's up to every organization, every um, training group to decide whether they want to do this or not. <clears throat> In this training, we will just go through these items so that it is more clear to you when you choose between the two options for attendance only or only with assessment to decide what works best for you. So the good thing about providing credentials only for attendance is that they, in this way, you encourage the participation of individuals to your training, if you say in the syllabus that you provide digital credentials for attendance, the probability that more people are going to go to this training is, of course, higher. 
uh, it's also promotes inclusivity so that all people that are interested in the topic will go through the training. They will not feel intimidated because there is an assessment. Uh, it's very easy to administer. So you just need the list of registered participants and uh, then just check who showed up and you provide the, um, the digital credentials to them. And of course, it's uh, building a learning culture of, of individuals. The bad side of providing digital credentials for attendance only is that the value of this type of digital credentials is uh, lower, right? It has less weight. Why? Because you, it only says that they attended the, the training, what they got out of the training, right? What are the learning outcomes? We don't know. We know the objectives of the training, but whether they have been achieved or not, it's a different matter. So from that point of view, they can be potentially misleading, right? If you show this certificate to an employer, sometimes by default, they think and expect that you have achieved the learning objectives into learning outcomes, but this may not be, may not be the case. So in a sense, uh, ex in, in a way, external people, when they see this type of credentials, they don't really make the difference between someone who was just there attending and someone who was actively engaged and doing the hands-on and, and stuff and, and everything. The other option is uh, for you to decide to provide digital credentials only for successful completion of assessment. This is the preferred way, as I mentioned in Skills for Use, but it's not like mandatory according to the framework or anything. What you get with this is that these digital credentials are actually going to demonstrate competency of the person, right? They have achieved the skills that uh, have been the learning objectives of the training that they have been to. So the recognition is much higher compared to the attendance. It motivates the people that attend to pay attention, to go through the material and everything. And you can also have different credentials for different skill levels, right? If someone has been more successful, you can give one type of credential. If someone has been less successful, you can give another type of, of credential if you decide to do so. The bad uh, view on this uh, type of digital credential is that the pressure for people is increased. So we expect them to learn, to achieve, to do something. So sometimes it's more intimidating. It might exclude some people because it's discouraging. It's uh, seen as less inclusive. Um, it's very much more complex to administer than the other one because you need to keep track of how successful they have been in each assessment, define the rules when you're going to issue what kind of digital credentials. And in the end, it depends on, on what you define successful completion. Sometimes when you compare different trainings that provide digital credentials for successful completion of assessment, because of the different rules on what is successful completion, there could be a risk of credential inflation. So some, some trainings might require very little for successful, some might require a lot and to external, um, people that don't know really the difference between the two, it will be difficult to compare these uh, digital credentials. So I'm just wondering from, from your point of view, from your experience, now that we talked a little bit about the difference between the digital credentials, what do you think? Which one would you choose? You can always choose both. You can also provide attendance and completion if you want. You can provide only the first one. You can provide only the second one. This, there is no right answer here. As I said, this is just my curiosity on what you would choose to, to do. Okay, as I see here, it's a bit divided. So someone is attendant, someone is a successful completion, some, someone is both. So yeah, I mean, it depends on the context, right? It, you always have to put it in, in your context, in, in the people that you are going to attend, in what you're trying to deliver and, and decide. There is no one rule that works in all of the cases. You, you need to adapt it to the environment. Now, how do you provide the digital credentials, right? There's the first thing is to decide for what you're going to give it, attendance, completion, both. Then the second thing to decide is, okay, how am I going to provide these digital credentials? 
So this is what we were doing in the skills for risk um, recognition framework task. We were trying to find a digital credential representation that is going to be standardized, that you can easily verify this credential when you show it, that it's portable to different devices in, in different formats. You can share it with your employers, with other people on social media. Of course, it has to be digital. You can also use it for micro-credentials, for macro-credentials, and it provides rich metadata. So you can describe this credential in a very detailed way. This was our goal. The first thing that we did was a landscaping analysis. What are other projects doing? What's happening out there? And so on. And we found that uh, different uh, organizations, different projects have different uh, attitudes towards uh, using digital credentials. Some of them use open badges. Some of them have decided to use European digital credentials, while others have either not made the decision or they did not provide digital credentials on the paper versions or uh, document-like versions or, or stuff like that. Uh, after the extensive landscaping analysis, we found that we actually have two candidates, two viable options for digital credentials in the end, which are the most popular and let's say the most suitable. They, they comply with our requirements. One was the digital open badges and the other one is quite new, newly established, the European digital credentials for, for learning. So I will tell you a little bit about the both so that uh, you can decide if uh, this is something that you would like to use, what are the pros and cons on each, of each of these uh, options. The first uh, is the open digital badges. So the idea of digital badges is to create a badge and issue a badge in order to recognize different competencies, skills, achievements, or attitude. So they are quite versatile. When you say open digital badge, you actually mean a digital image, a digital picture that comes together with uh, machine readable metadata. And inside this metadata, there is uh, information on who is issuing the badge, to whom, and on what basis, why, for this training, for this many credits, for this accomplishment, for these skills, and so on. The standard for the image and for the metadata is uh, very well defined and very well maintained initially by the Mozilla Foundation, now by IMS Global that uh, took over the work. And it uh, provides um, a way to verify that the issuer has really issued this digital image together with the, together with the metadata. Um, how it looks like. So this is just an example of an open badge. So it's like an image of whatever you decide. The image is up to you to decide. And then these uh, things that you see next to the image is actually the metadata that can be uh, stored inside. So it's the criteria for the badge, uh, textual description of the badge, name of the badge, digital signature of the issuer so that it can be verified that the, the badge is uh, correct. Uh, what is the evidence for which the badge is provided? Is there an expiration date that doesn't have to be? Uh, what is the date when this badge was issued? Who issued it? Who is the recipient? Um, how it can be verified? There might be a link where you can click and you can verify that this badge is uh, really issued by that by that issuer. So there are different information that you can put inside and you can really describe uh, what is this badge about? Why was it obtained by this person? At what at what time? What is interesting about the digital badges and why we why we like them and we decided to, to use them as a viable option is that you can collect them in a so-called backpack or passport or wallet. One of the examples is Badger here, which is a free open system. Anybody can use it. And you can collect all of your badges, uh, individual badges there. You can also group them into categories, play with them, whatever. The interesting thing that was one of the stuff that was important for us was also that the badges can be shared on social media. So you can share the image on social media and say, yeah, I got this badge now. And when people click on the badge, they can read the metadata and read the details about the, the metadata. 
On the right hand side, you see an example of a badge that we provide. It's the Fair by Design Methodology Specialist Instructor Badge. And on the right hand side, you see the metadata that is uh, related to this badge. It's awarded to me in February, issued by Skills for Us for the Fair by Design course. And there is this. Uh, text that describes the learning objectives that I have achieved with the with the training. Um, how you can issue an open badge? You can use different tools. There are many free open tools. The, the interesting thing about open learning badges is that it can be integrated with a lot of different learning platforms, which is very nice. For example, we use Moodle, and on the right hand side you see the GUI of how you define badges for a course in, in Moodle. But it's similar in any other tool. What you need to do is prepare the image because as I said, the image can be anything you want. So you design the image. We have templates for the badges in skills for us. And then you fill out these details about the, the badge, the description, the, uh, the expiry date, the, I don't know, uh, criteria and so on. Inside the learning platform, you can define the issuing criteria, whether it's manual or whether it's uh, automatic. For example, we usually use automatic issuing because in this way, it's very easy to provide the badges to the recipients. So we say, okay, in order to obtain this clear by design instructor badge, you need to uh, accomplish all of the assessments inside the course and achieve minimum 80% on each of the, each of the assessments. Um, the interesting thing is that, as I mentioned before, you can use the badges for micro-credentials. So what we did, for an example, in the Fair by Design Methodology course, and you can actually achieve this if, if you want, you can go to the uh, course, Anastas maybe paste the link to the course in, in the chat, and you can do the assessment there, and uh, you can achieve one, two, or all of these um, badges, depending on what you complete because what we defined is we defined different badges for each of the stages of the fair by design methodology and then we defined this higher level badge which you obtain only if you obtain all of the lower level badges so you can do this hierarchical issuing of badges if you want link each lower level badge to a micro credential and then have a higher level badge if um, uh, what's the word? If a, a, a larger content of, of learning material has been has been covered, and you can play with this uh, if you want. The second option, what we were looking into, is the European Digital Credentials for Learning. They also have their own standard, which is defined. The what is different with 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 the open badges is that they are tamper proof. What does it mean, tamper proof? Is that once the credential is issued, nobody can tamper with it, nobody can change anything inside it without me verifying, noticing it. Uh, of course, there are digital electronic documents. They describe that the owner has a certain skill or a group of skills or achieved uh, one or more learning outcomes. And it supports any type of learning context. So it can be about formal, non-formal, informal training. It, it goes from micro-credentials to diploma certificates from universities. So you can use the European Digital Credentials for anything. This is how a European Digital Credential looks like. So it contains a lot of metadata about the credential. Of course, things such as who is the issuer, what is the subject of the digital credential? What were the activities, the achievements, the learning outcomes? Were there assessments, no assessment? Did they achieve some entitlements or attestations? Were there any, I don't know, credits? Um, do, do you want to add information about the hours of work spent or hours of apprenticeship or, or whatever? So it's quite a large, set of metadata that you can use to really describe in details the credential that you're providing. But you don't, everything is optional. So you can make it very general or you can really make it very specific. The interesting thing here and very specific for European digital credential is this e-seal that you see on the in the upper right corner. 
this is the tamper proof thing. So this e seal needs to be acquired by the issuer and you use it as a type of digital signature. So once you create the digital credential, you seal it with the e seal and it becomes tamper proof. So anybody that gets the document can share it with others, of course, but they cannot change the content, the content inside. The interesting thing about the uh, European digital credentials is that they can be stored in a wallet. This wallet, unlike the open badges, it's, it comes together with Europass. It's integrated inside Europass. So it, it's not just any wallet you want to use. It's one wallet inside Europass. And this is how the credential looks like inside this wallet. So you see the main three points is who received it. Sonia, who is the issuer, skills for USC. How this document looks like on the left hand side, you see it's like a, let's say, standard template for a PDF certificate. You can change it, the layout, information inside, whatever you want. And then on the right hand side, you see all of the metadata associated with it. So the awarding date, the uh, learning outcomes, for an example, the learning settings, the modes, the language, the type. As I said, there are so many, and you are the one that decides which of these things you are going to add to the credentials or which you want to omit. Behind it, there is this so-called European learning model, which actually creates a, the connections between this uh, metadata information inside the digital credential. So who Anna that was, uh, I don't know, born on a date, she took the course on something and claims that she has achieved applied mathematics, which is proven by a written exam that is defined with the assessment specification. And she managed to pass it with a certain grade and then acquired different skills like execute analytical mathematical calculations and use mathematical tools and equipment. So this is how you describe the, the digital credential. As I mentioned, to be able to issue it, you need the qualified ECU, which you need to buy from a provider. Once you have it, you need to use the so-called credential builder online to define the template. When you have the template of the credentials, then you prepare a list of receivers, names, and email addresses. And you say, okay, issue these um, credentials with this template to this list of receivers. And they receive it via email and they can decide to store it in their wallets on, on Europass. This is how the credential builder looks like. So there are many fields that you can fill in. As I mentioned, most of them are optional. So you decide what you want to fill in or not. One of the Interesting thing is that, for an example, when you define the related learning outcomes, um, there is actually a lot of support for ontologies based description of skills. So you can write free text here if you want, but it's um, recommended that you use ontologies and they support, for an example, the ESCO skills ontologies or custom ontologies for which you need to provide the URI for, for the system to understand the the technology. The current state is that the European digital credentials, unlike the open badges, they cannot be really seamlessly integrated in a learning platform. They are working on it. It will be available soon, but not now. As I mentioned, there is financial cost. It's not free like the badges. You need to buy the ECU, and usually you buy it on a temporal basis, so let's say years, one month, six months, depending on the provider. The definition of the template, it requires a lot of manual work. The credential builder is nice and everything, but it's it's hard to automate stuff. And there are many, many fields you need to fill out. Uh, but it's nice that other people can prepare the template and then just send it to the issuing institution so that the administrative burden can be actually shared between different uh, people. There is a possibility to automate stuff, but in order to do this, you need to locally install, install the infrastructure for European digital credentials and not use the online system that I showed you, I showed you before. So when you compare the two, they're not, it's not like you need to make a decision, I will use badges or I will use digital credentials. 
you can use them together because they provide different things and they are in a way complementary. Of course, always keep in mind that the European digital credentials are more provide more ways because they are much more official, right? And uh, at this moment, uh, the number of universities that are using it for providing uh, digital credentials is uh, increasing by, not by the minute, but, but every month, for an example. And it is considered that, uh, for an example, these digital credentials are going to be the main documents that are going to be used for the Erasmus mobility, verification of credits and, and stuff like that, because they are really formal and they are really, really temper proof. If you have any opinion on the badges or the digital credentials, or you think there is another viable options that we haven't covered, I'm really, really asking you to give us this input by filling out the survey for the skills for EOS recognition framework. You will find it on the skills for USC website in the participate part where we have all of the materials for a community review. So you can download the draft deliverable that we have and you can fill out this EU survey form and give us your opinion on this matter. We will be extremely grateful if, if, you, do, if you do that. I will share the link with you in the chat now that we are done with this part. So with this, we went through the recognition framework. I gave you a few options on what, in what way you can provide digital credentials for your learning materials, whether it's attendance or whether it's successful assessment accomplishment. And now I give the floor back to Anastas to continue with the next topic. Okay, so the next presentation refers to the publishing considerations that need to be made when you are ready with your material and you want to make it publicly available um, to the general to the general public. Sonia mentioned that it's a phase separate phase in the methodology. Uh, the, you publish the materials, uh, uh, you publish both uh, materials for the learners and for the for the, the trainers, for the instructors on separate platform, etc. We will focus mostly on publishing the materials for the trainers will not go into deep explaining the whole the whole publishing phase with all the details we'll just mention some more important uh, things we need to consider when we reach this this uh, phase so we'll talk about the um, repository where you should publish your your files the accompanying files that need to be edited to uh, to reflect the 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 content of the of the material. We'll say a few words about technique called fair signposting. I'll tell you a little bit later, and we'll finish up with the automated automated publishing workflow that we have implemented in um, in GitHub for the methodology that does lots of things automatically for you. So uh, the first, of course, is the choice of the repository. Uh, of course, the methodology uh, suggests that uh, you always opt out for the open science repository, repository that is well known to the, to the community. Since we were producing quite general training material, we opted for a general purpose uh, open science repository. And of course, uh, the, the choice is very frequently ends up at Zenodo. That's what we did, of course. But anyway, other communities might choose other different repositories uh, suitable for the purpose, um, well known to their community, uh, well known to within the, the, the both trainers and, and learners, learners uh, community. Uh, repositories are of course important mostly for the trainers because in the repository we publish the materials that it is intended to be used by the instructors, by the trainers. The materials that is intended to be used for delivery of the courses for the learners is usually usually um, published on a learning management system like Moodle or, Moodle or many, many other. So in the case of methodology, our choice was Zenodo for quite uh, a lot of reasons. First of all, is the maybe the, the best known open science repository, but there was also a very important feature that is um, integrated into Zenodo and it is the 
GitHub Zenodo integrations. It means that these two tools can be can be quite tightly integrated, and you can automate most of the of the processes that otherwise you would do you would do manually to make your you make uh, to to um to follow all the all the needed steps and actions of the of the methodology. But before you do the next release, before you do the publishing, there are some files that are need to be edited uh, that are recommended by the methodology to better explain your materials, to better reflect the 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 um, the content and other other relevant things. We'll mention a couple of them here. Uh, the readme file, readme is a uh, uh, MD file that is usually at the at the at the um, root uh, that sits at the root of the repository, and it's actually the first uh, thing that the visitors can get can see when they visit the GitHub repository. So when you actually visit a GitHub repository, the GitHub website displays the content of the readme MD file. So whatever you need to present. On the first hand, to the uh, 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 as a as a as a uh, as a first presentation to the visitors of your repository should be part of the of the readme md file. Another file is also we consider another file uh, important here the code of conduct file. Again, it is a md file that uh, we say that these are the things that we need to adhere to. Uh, it defines the standards or how to engage in a community, how to resolve possible problems that might occur uh, within the, while developing the, the the material. Might also might also uh, uh, contain um, steps to resolve issues, etc. Uh, GitHub will show a direct link to the repository code of conduct if there is such file just above the citation citation information. Uh, the third file is the license file. The license file is again not mandatory uh, by by um, uh, within the methodology, but um, a license file is a text file that contains the description of the license under which the specific training material is uh, is um, is uh, released. Uh, it's actually something that you uh, copy from the from the. From the license, from the sites that contain the description of the licensing, like the Creative Commons for Zero licensing site, where you can find text versions of all the licenses that you you release. Uh, our uh, materials are released at the CC0, and the, the content of the CC0, the whole description of the CC0, is presented in the in the license uh, text file, the plain text file. Uh, Another thing that is very useful to be to be accounted for for within the within the training material is the contributors. Uh, in the fair by design methodology, we don't have a special format or a special file that defines the contributor roles aside from the RDA metadata fields that list the authors of this of this material. But this does not necessarily need to be this way depending on the community some communities decide that they need to have more gran granular roles from the contributors so it's different from the the one that produced the material the one that tested the material that one that edited or made the user user interface of the material from the one that uh, that did a specific translation of the of the material etc etc so uh, there are uh, ways to not standardize, but help you do the the roles of the contributors in in your in your training material. For example, uh, you might decide to use a contributors file within the repository and adopt some methodology, some 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 taxonomy like the contributor role taxonomy, the credit taxonomy, which is taxonomy used for scientific publications. Uh, with the the link to the to the taxonomy is uh, available both in the material and the presentation, and you can use this to guide you on how to how to um, how to define the roles and how to how to describe the the people in the specific in the specific roles. 
Uh, there is another specification that's uh, called all contributor specification. Again, an open source project that uh, includes um, elements that are considered, uh, some of them considered mandatory, some considered optional. That's all the contributors that contribute to, to something, to some, some, some product need to be listed. It actually, so, um, uh, again, um, uh, means that you have to have a contributor's file at the root of the repository containing some informations like the name, the URL, the category of the contribution, and the link to the definitions of different categories of, of, of contributions. Uh, we used here the example from our colleagues from the Galaxy Training Network. The Galaxy Training Network is a, a comprehensive uh, a training repository related to the Galaxy tool, which is used in the biomedical communities. And they have a specific uh, breakdown of the of the roles uh, that uh, needs to be in a specific file, uh, accounted to in a specific file. And there is the, just a screenshot of the different roles that one can have with uh, related to a specific to a specific training material in the GTN, the Galaxy Training Network. We mentioned the fair sign posting. The fair sign posting is a very interesting addition that we did. It was not part of the first release. We did, did it uh, added later to the to the to the methodology. The fair, fair sign posting uh, represent a very light uh, lightweight but very very powerful approach to increase the fairness of the learning materials by increasing their machine re re readability. This means that. The fair sign posting actually adds elements, adds metadata element to the web version of the document, to the Git, in our case, to the Git pages that enable robots and crawlers and other machine, uh, machine uh, um, readers to recognize the material and classify the material, uh, better understand what is there within this material, etc. So it's a special kind of, 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 of metadata that is present in the HTML file. So it's not part of the, of the MD files like the, fair, like the RDA metadata, which is uh, we consider mandatory for the learning material. This is something that is optional, that is very useful and will manifest itself in the, in the web version of the, of, the, of the training material, actually in the in the Git pages. It uh, has two levels of compliance, the level one compliance, minimal set of typed links with the landing page as the link origin, while the link two, uh, level two elevates this to uh, providing a more comprehensive uh, set of links, landing pages, content, metadata resources, etc. So if you clone the repository, Fair sign posting is uh, is uh, already part of, of of our repository, and it's already part of the automatic workflow that we have implemented in the in the Git repository of the template or in the other any other course within the uh, Fair by Design methodology organization. So, uh, when you make any changes to the to the material, uh, Git actions update the necessary elements update uh, the the git pages etc but the most important thing is when you make a new release so when you make a new release uh, of the materials which makes that means that you have uh, which we talked about in a previous presentation means that a special set of action takes place within the within the repository to automate everything that is needed to keep these materials within the FAIR methodology uh, uh, requirements. It validates the information in the accompanying files. So it checks the accompanying files. It implements the sign posting uh, that we mentioned previously. If it's the first release, it will create a draft entry in Zenodo. If it's a new release, it will update the Zenodo, the Zenodo, um, the Zenodo uh, uh, entry. It will update the DOI accordingly to match the, the version. 
and will update all the files that reference it. If you use web, if you use uh, PowerPoint slides, for example, with a specific specific footnote, there is a, an action that will automatically update and insert the correct DOI in the slides, in the syllabus. So everywhere the DOI is referenced within your material will be the correct DOI of the latest, latest release in Zenodo. It will rebuild everything and release a new version at the at the at the git at the git book. And as a result of this, new and updated entry in the Zenodo repository, updated citations in the git pages, updated citation CFF file, updated fair posting, signed post data, and updated citation in the PowerPoint slides if if used. Please bear in mind that some of these fields that we mentioned and some of these files uh, can be edited and should be edited manually, while the others should not be changed manually because they are changed and updated by the by the automated workflow that workflow that is a part of the of the repository. For example, fields in the citation CFF file like the version, the DOI, the date released will be automatically updated, and you should not change them change them manually. And as I said, as a result, you will get a new entry in Zenodo. This is actually the entry of this specific training material, the Fair by Design for Clarin Community Training Material. It contains all the material in a zip archive. It contains all the necessary link. It contains the DOI. This is the only version that we have now. So it's the only one version. If there are multiple versions, you will see multiple versions and multiple, multiple DOIs of this. Just a couple of slides on the co-creation because uh, we consider that the contribution of the wider community is necessary to develop something that will be relevant to the wider to the wider community just a few words about the the co-creation process the the incremental changes the analysis of the of the feedback and of course the final stage or the uh, I would not sell it the, call it the final stage it's actually at the same time the final and the first stage is the stage that connects the final stage to the first stage of the of the fair by design methodology which is the continuous continuous improvement it's the line that circles everything uh, all the all the all the stages in the in the nice picture that sonia showed you before uh, it's very important to have a regular analysis of all quality assurance aspects uh, so we can identify potential we can identify first errors um things that are maybe wrong in the element, but also connect, identify elements that we can improve to make our material better, to make it more suitable for a specific community, to make it more understandable, etc. So in order to do this, we need to do some kind of collecting of some kind of, uh, of feedback. So based on this feedback analysis, we should make a plan how to develop the new version of the of the learning of the learning materials and how do we get the feedback well first of all it's important to get feedback from all relevant stakeholders from all relevant parties we get feedback both from the learners but also from the instructors that have used these materials that did a workshop or a, or a webinar using this this material uh, some of the sources of the feedback mentioned here provide us with uh, feedback from one of these uh, groups, some provide from both of these group. Of course, the most obvious form of collection of the feedback is the feedback form, something you give to the to the training participants at the end or just after the end of, of each training session, workshop or, or, or whatever it is, uh, to collect their first impressions from the from the from the training. Um, the feedback, uh, the, the the methodology provides uh, a sample feedback forms, examples for how to implement these uh, these feedback forms for your own needs. But of course, it's open to your specific needs, to your specific materials. Direct email contact is uh, also another form of collecting feedback. You see the email, actually Sonia's email in all the slides at the end because she leads this task. So uh writing to 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 the contact person with some of the 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 the, the feedback some of the 
remarks or notes that you have or some of the proposed imp improvements can be a, a, a very, very useful to improve the materials. Having external quality assurance is always very, very useful. Uh, it's not, uh, we always make this, this joke that whenever you try to review your own material, you are not actually reading what is written. You are reading what you meant to write before. And you need a fresh set of eye. You need a quality, external quality assurance to help you with a more objective view and to give your feedback on these materials. Any kind of comments that can be collected from this, comments in the chat of the of the of the Zoom uh, session of the webinar, comments in the GitHub platform. GitHub, for example, allows you to comment. GitHub allows you to create each issues. For the for the some of the for the elements, it's usually corrected corrected uh, connected to the software, but you have you could have an issue with the learning material. There is a separate space in in this in uh, in uh, in GitHub dedicated to discussions. So it's a, a an area where you can discuss different elements. All this is a very important um, uh, it's a very important um, way of collecting opinions of, of other people on your training material. But equally important is your own opinion, the self-reflection. So once you finished delivering a training material using this specific training material, it's always good to sit back and make a self-reflection on this. What you liked, what you don't didn't like, what you missed, what you have, what would you have done differently if you could have, I don't know, more more resources, more time, more face-to-face um, -face instead of a web uh, instead of a webinar or webinar instead of a face-to-face -face delivery, etc. And as a result of all of this, a list of potential improvements should be made. Each of these entries in this list list should be marked with an impact level trying to 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 separate them at in in at least three different categories high moderate and low impact level and of course start start making the changes addressing first the high one then the moderate one and the low level impact ones and in the end is the continuous improvement the continuous improvement is this magic cycle that actually never never ends you collect the feedback you analyze, you analyze what is there, collect the feedback from all, all the channels that we, we, we mentioned and maybe even more that we didn't mention here. Analyze all the, all the feedback, find out what is relevant, what sometimes might be a non-relevant feedback. It very often happens to have non-relevant feedback, but analyze it all uh, and then implement a new version and then publish it. And then again, the magic circle starts again. Collect feedback, analyze, implement, and publish. We are now into the last part of the training, which is the quality assurance part. First, we'll go through the quality assurance uh, as defined by the Fair by Design methodology. And then we're going to do a hands-on where you will be asked to measure, <clears throat> so measure the quality of to different resources from your community, just to, to take a look how these checklists uh, look like, what is required. Can you find the information needed in order to fill out the checklist and things like that. And then we will have a general discussion and wrap up this training. So let's start first with the quality assurance. Uh, we are mentioning quality assurance so many times during the fair by design methodology because it's really an essential part of it all. If you want uh, good learning materials, they need to have high quality. And when we say quality, we don't mean just to make them fair, but also quality of the content and the uh, way it is presented to the learners as well. So every aspect of the learning resource. And um, according to the methodology, once you arrive, if you remember, we mentioned also at the end of produce, you first do an internal quality assurance. This is just to check if you have all of the required elements, if you've done, if you developed all the content and reused all the content that you initially planned to, to do it. So it's more like, um, have I done everything I was planning to do? 
However, when you arrive in the verify stage, which is the last stage after publication, now you have a final version of your learning resources. It's time to really pay attention to the quality and to make sure that you've done it all by the methodology, not by the book, by the methodology. Um, so for these purposes, when you enter the verify, the first step that we recommend that you do is to do a self-check. So do a self-check quality assurance, check if, if everything is uh, as it should be, then you're going to do the rest of the quality assurance steps. For the self-check part, our recommendation is to use the quality assurance guidelines and checklists that are developed by a different task, which is developing the quality assurance framework inside uh, skills for yes And inside this um, deliverable of this task, there are a number of checklists that can be used to check the quality of the learning materials. There are four in total, however, we omitted one because it's not relevant for your community. There is a separate checklist on the minimum viable skills and profiles to, to ensure in alignment of the learning material with the skills defined in the profiles, which are not of such importance to, in your case. However, the other three can really be implemented in your community as well and might be of interest to you, so that's why we will talk about that. The first one is the general quality assurance checklist. So as the name says, it's a general quality assurance. So it focuses on the content of the learning materials and analyzes the quality from the learner's perspective. Does it have everything? Is it clear? Do the learners get what they expect? Is the content multimodal and all of these uh, things? The second one is the fair by design quality assurance checklist. This one focuses on the FAIR aspect. So did you use the FAIR by design methodology? If you use, do you have these, these, these items to make the materials FAIR and to make them even more FAIR if possible, right? Because there are some things inside the methodology that we require you to do and some things that are optional to do but can improve the fairness of the material. The last one is the so-called LC quality assurance checklist. LC is the acronym for ethical, legal, and societal issues related to open science. So these are mostly uh, questions that are related to uh, whether the materials that are provided are uh, 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 comply with all of the legal issues that might arise, with all of the ethical issues that you have to consider, and any societal issues that, that might be there. All of these checklists, so no matter which one, the general, the fair by design, the LC, and the MVS as well, they are divided into two parts. So they have a list of indicators. Each of these checklists has a list of indicators. Every indicator has a certain weight. It can be one, it can be more points, depending on the indicator. Uh, and every indicator is defined as essential or optional. If the indicator is essential, that means that this indicator has to be achieved. It has to have at least one point to pass the checklist. Otherwise, it will be considered that you haven't passed the checklist that contains that indicator. For an example, for the fair by design methodology, there are a certain number of indicators related to the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we say, if you don't pass these indicators, your material is not fair. The rest of the indicators are optional. That means that they are nice to have a feature. It increases the quality of your learning materials. It increases the fairness of your learning materials. But if you don't have them, it doesn't mean that you're not fair, for an example, if it is the fair by design methodology checklist in, in question. So essentials are the one that you are the ones that you have to have. They are a must. Optionals are a nice to have feature. The more you have, the higher the quality, the higher the fairness, the higher the compliance with the LC issues. If you don't have them, then consider them as input for the um, improvement list for the continuous improvement. This is also one of the inputs that, that you can use. 
this is how the the checklists look like. This is the example of uh, the general quality assurance checklist. I will not show you the indicators of all of the checklists uh, individually because it will take a lot of time and you will do it. You will see them in the hands-on exercise. So just this is just to give you an example of what are these indicators, how they look like. And also to give you another information and point, and that is that the FAIR by Design methodology has been developed in collaboration with the Quality Assurance Task Force. What does it mean? It means that if you follow the FAIR by Design methodology, that you are automatically doing things that will help you pass all of the indicators in the rest of the checklists. So in, in the general QA, in the LC, in the LC QA. And on this slide, you see the essential indicators for the general quality assurance checklist. And in the bullets under each of the indicator, it tells you how these are addressed by the fair by design methodology. For example, the first indicator is, does the learning material have a clear title, right? And the title is mandatory according to the RDA minimum metadata schema which we use in order to develop the syllabus. So you will, of course, have a title because you're following the schema. You just need to make sure that this title is clear and descriptive to the learners. It's similar with the target audience, which is also part of the RDA minimum metadata schema. It's similar with the level of expertise that is required from the from the audience. So you see all of these questions that are the essential questions of the general quality assurance checklist are actually going to be part of the syllabus if you're following the fair by design methodology. Some of them are specifically related to the RDA minimum metadata schema. Some are additional fields like this indicator here, which is uh, does the learning material specify the developer author of the of the learning material. Actually, no, I have a mistake here. It should say metadata here as well, because the authors are also part of the RDA minimum metadata schema. I will fix this in the next version of GitHub, but uh, keep in mind here as we are doing it, doing it live. Um, the rest of the questions are, for an example, does it, does it uh, include information regarding the access cost, which is also a mandatory field for the RDA minimum metadata schema? Does it include relevant keywords? Uh, does it state the delivery method? Is it a live session? Is it uh, online learning? Is it hybrid? Is it face for face? Whatever it is. So as you see, all of this information you're going to have inside your syllabus. And with this, you are actually covering the essential fields of the uh, general quality assurance checklist. It's the same with the optional fields. I just don't have them presented here in the slides, but if you go to the Git pages for this training, you will see the complete list of the checklists, of all of the checklists that we are covering, that we are covering here, and you will see them also in the hands-on after this. These are the essential indicators for the fair by design quality assurance checklists. So these are the things that you must have if you want to say that your learning materials are fair by design. Uh, that's why we always have yes in the essential column. The second column that you see here in the table stage actually tells you in which of the stages of the fair by design methodology you address the different indicators. So some of them during the prepare stage, some of them in design, some of them in produce, some of them in, in publish. The third column is very interesting. This one tells you what fair aspect you're actually addressing with the different indicators. For example, um, the use of the metadata schema is related to the interoperability principle of the fair principles. Uh, or uh, the clear attribution of reused resources is related to the, to the reuse. And if you take a, a more deeper look into the essential indicators, you will actually see that there are two essential indicators per each type of FAIR principle. So there are two for findable, two for accessible, two for interoperable, and two for, for reusable. And uh, they address the minimum requirements needed to say that something is FAIR according to the definition in the FAIR uh, principles with one extension 
And this extension is regarding the accessibility. If you remember, I already mentioned several times that because it's learning materials, when we say accessibility, we also include accessibility from the learner's point of view. And that means that the learning content should be accessible to the widest audience possible, which is not part of the essential FAIR principles as they are defined. Accessibility there means access to the uh, resource only. The essentials for the ethical, legal, and societal issues are the ones presented here. You see, in, with the colors, I gave you a hint of the keywords that are required. For example, do you have terms of service for the resource? Uh, is the IP owner identified? Are you using st standard licenses? Are the licenses machine and human readable? Are, if you are using multiple licenses, are they interoperable? Uh, is there attribution if you're reusing sources and is there data provenance provided? So these are the minimum information that you need to pass. You have to pass in order to say that you are LC quality assurance, that you pass the LC quality assurance. Of course, there are additional optional. For the LC quality assurance part, honestly, even when it comes to, to me, and I've been dealing with a lot of LC issues inside the skills for us lately, I, I think that uh, in order to fill out the, the checklist correctly and make sure that you address every possible ethical, legal, societal aspect that is um, asked in there, you need the uh, help of an LC professional. Otherwise, you need to be very well versed into these uh, terms that you see here, for an example, terms of what is terms of service, what is IP owner, um, what licenses are interoperable, what are not, and so on. So these are a bit, uh, let's say, technical terms that not all of us that are traditional instructional designers, people that develop learning materials that we know beforehand, right? So we see in the prepare stage, stage of the fear by design that you should familiarize yourself with licenses and things, but this uh, checklist requires uh, deep knowledge of, of licenses and things. So uh, maybe it's good to do it with, with someone who has this knowledge or make sure that you read a little bit more about it before you do the, do the checklist. So once you do the self-check, and you pass everything. If you don't pass, you fix what you want to fix. At least you have to fix the essentials or the optional. As I said, they can be input for continuous improvement. Then you go into the next step of quality assurance. And this is the external quality assurance. As Anastas mentioned, it's always a very nice idea to give the stuff that you develop to someone else because the pair of fresh eyes will review the learning materials without cognitive bias. There is always a problem when the author reviews his own, her own learning materials because there is this cognitive bias. When you do it with an external person, you don't have any cognitive bias and this is what you want to, to do. You can give them the guidelines and the checklist as a starting point but make sure that you tell them not to focus on me on them, okay? One of the brilliant things about external quality assurance is that they will think outside the box. So they will ask for things, look for things that are maybe not written down in the checklist. So it's uh, great to get any form of feedback. The one, all of the recommendations that are going to be received from this point, you can uh, divide into a, uh, potential improvements list, the high impact you need to address as soon as possible, but the ones with lower level impact, you can also include them as input for the continuous improvement and say, okay, in the next version, we will think about this and that and so on. Never forget that this type of quality assurance that we do in the end, it's learner oriented. So you check everything from the point of view of a learner, of someone else, okay? Not the developer, not the one that was developing the material. So that means that you put yourself in the shoes of a learner. And when we say you can access the material, yes, you can access as a learner, not as a owner of the content. 
and um, you can um, use the content the way you intend the content to be used by the by the learners. If there are any problems with accessing using the content from the learner point of view, these are high impact issues and you need to resolve them as soon as possible. So because I mean the final idea of the learning material is to be used by learners. So if they cannot use it, then it's a problem that needs to be fixed right, right, right away. So in a summary, we said verify is an essential step, right? In the methodology, you, you cannot skip it. You have to go through verify. You do a self-verify. You do an external verification. You do it from both point of views. So from the learner point of view, very, very important. And from the point of view of another instructional designer, trainer that would like to reuse your material. You divide all of the outputs from this quality assurance into a list, the high impact priorities you deal with right away. The rest is input for the continuous improvement process together with all of the other inputs from the co-creation that Anastas was uh, telling you about. <laughs>